Thank you, Daniel. Um, <laughs> hi, everyone. I'm Vivek Krishnamurthy. I'm really delighted uh, to be here introducing our guest today, Mr. Jean-Pierre Blais, who is the chairman of the Canadian Radio, Television, and Telecommunications Commission. A mouthful, so I, I implore you to use CRTC instead. Um, it's a distinct pleasure as uh, I am both a, a Berkman Klein person uh, at the Cyberlock Clinic and also Canadian, so uh, it's wonderful to have uh, this, this co-sponsored event between Berkman Klein and the Canadian Law Students Association uh, here at the law school. Uh, so Ch Chairman Blight has uh, been the uh, chairman of the CRTC since June 2012. It's a five-year term. And he came to that position after a long and distinguished and varied career in Canadian public service, uh, starting in the CRTC's legal directorate, where he rose to became, become general counsel before then becoming the executive director of broadcasting in 1999 and overseeing the regulatory framework uh, to allow for the development of digital uh, pay TV and specialty TV uh, uh, channels. He then moved to the Department of Canadian Heritage where he was assistant deputy minister of cultural affairs and created a task force on new technologies to study the impact of the internet and digital technologies on Canadian cultural policies. And somehow during his time there he found uh, the, the bandwidth to be the Canadian government's representative on the ultimately successful committee that bid on uh, the Winter Olympic Games in Vancouver in 2010. So <clears throat> since uh, Mr. Blair took over the chairmanship, the CRTC, uh, I would say, has been a real leader amongst its peer regulatory organizations in innovating in regulation. And before the, the, the main topic of today's presentation, in 2015, the CRTC garnered global headlines with its decision to require cable operators to unbundle specialty TV channels and offer a la carte pricing. So uh, if you want to watch Ice Road Truckers on history, you don't have to pay <laughs> for uh, uh, Justin Bieber videos on Much Music, which is Canada's uh, equivalent of MTV. Uh, today's presentation, however, focuses on the CRTC's uh, very significant decision late last year to classify broadband internet service as a basic service along the lines of the venerable local telephone service. Um, and so doing, we're looking very forward to hearing Chairman Blais' thoughts on the future of internet connectivity in Canada, around the world, and the role that regulators can play uh, in ensuring that the digital future is the one that we want to live in. Now, uh, as Daniel emphasized, this event is being live streamed and uh, recorded for posterity. Um, if you are online and would like to participate, you can ask questions, uh, solicit, uh, submit comments using the hashtag CRTC. And without further ado, I would like to uh, welcome Chairman Blair. Thank you very much. I think I'm mic'd up so that I can put this mic down. Uh, real pleasure uh, to be here today. Um, and uh, I was going to do a presentation and then uh, leave plenty of time for uh, questions and answers uh, there. And I promise you I won't mention the hockey game last night, um, being from Ottawa. Um, so um, to, uh, for the hockey fans in the room. Um, the, um, uh, today, I, I wanted to talk about and give us some context about what the CRTC is and does in its history, and then take the uh, basic telecommunications service uh, proceeding and decisions as a bit of a case study, and then we can have uh, uh, questions and answers uh, dealing with that. But um, why don't we start out with a, a short video that in about a minute 48 seconds will summarize what the CRTC does. We live in a rapidly evolving digital world. You are yeah. using technology to work, play. Okay, why don't we? St yeah, we'll start over. We live in a rapidly evolving digital world. You are using technology to work, play, and connect with each other.
you spend a lot of time watching, listening, and consuming media. Technology has become essential in every part of our lives, from health to education, from safety to security, and to the strength of the economy. You deserve communications networks and services that you can count on. The CRTC plays an important role to make that a reality. We ensure that you have access to a world-class communication system, one with reliable and secure networks, and choice of affordable and high-quality services, whether you're living in Kujuak, working in the prairies, or sitting in a cafe in Montreal. We protect you from unwanted calls and spam while ensuring businesses can continue to compete in the global marketplace. We ensure you can create and share your stories, whether on the radio, television, or over the internet. You can shape the future. Learn more about your CRTC at crtc.gc.ca. So, it encapsulates in a, in, a, in a short video what we do, but the mere fact that we have a corporate video, it was a big change for the commission, which we wanted to go out and talk to Canadians uh, because the commission as an institution was suffering from regulatory capture, uh, very close to the industry regulated, and we wanted to disintermediate uh, the, and speak directly to Canadians. So we have done a lot, and this is just one example of us trying to reach above and directly to the Canadians. And you'll notice when we talk about your CRTC, the, the CRTC of, or, uh, of Canadians. So the commission was created in 1968. Uh, at the time, it was called the Canadian Radio Television Commission, so only responsible for broadcasting. Became a converged regulator in 1996. Uh, previously to that, it was the Canadian Transportation Agency, sort of the, rail, the equivalency of the, of the railroad uh, companies because of the telegraph aspect that regulated uh, the, uh, uh, the telecom uh, world. Uh, and so it all came together in 1968. We're an administrative tribunal, uh, which means uh, in Canadian law that uh, we have uh, certain duties to act fairly, uh, respect certain procedural rules, but we tend not to be a a, a very legalistic, uh, we don't swear in witnesses, except sometimes when we think we're not being told the full truth, but that's actually quite rare. Um, and we are in the Canadian legal systems quite high in terms of, uh, uh, of our positioning as a quasi-judicial tribunal. When originally created in 1968, the Federal Court of Canada didn't exist yet, and appeals of our decisions went directly to the Supreme Court of Canada, and only on leave and only on questions of law. And certainly some of our decisions are also reviewable by the Canadian cabinet, um, uh, but mostly for policy uh, reasons. And uh, from a governance perspective, we are independent uh, and arm's length from the, the, the government. Um, we do not, um, uh, it, it, it's somewhat unlike the FCC, where when there's a change of the executive arm, there is a change at the FCC. We are very much uh, more independent, even though cabinet appoints the governing council, the, the, the cabinet appoints the members of the commission, the deciders. Uh, the fact remains that uh, once you're appointed, you cannot be removed except for a very serious uh, reason. Um, because of our nature and following Dicean uh, uh, notions of rule of law, the Commission uh, can only do what the statute enabling it uh, allows it uh, to do. Uh, and our statutes include the Telecommunications Act, which we'll talk a lot about today, but also the Broadcasting Act, which regulates broadcasting, a much broader definition uh, than here in the United States. Uh, we give licenses to specialty networks. Uh, we are heavily involved in licensing distribution undertakings, whether they're cable or satellite or uh, IPTV. And uh, it's contrary to here, there's very, very little role for uh, municipal or provincial or territorial governments in this uh, space. It's uh, almost exclusively uh, federal jurisdiction um, in this area. Um, the other statutes other than the Broadcasting Act and Telecommunications Act we get involved in are the Canadian anti-spam uh, legislation, 
or what we call castle, uh, because the actual title of the legislation, because it was a minority government and they couldn't agree on anything, are, um, the name of the statute is actually too long to uh, write a tweet about. Um, it just goes on and on and on. It's one of these uh, long titles that uh, had political reasons uh, behind them. So we just call it uh, the uh, uh, anti-spam legislation or CASEL. When I was first appointed at the CRTC, I said, why do you call it CASEL? Like all the, you know, it's always the Canadian anti-spam legislation. We don't call it the Canadian um, Copyright Act or the Canadian Broadcasting Act. And the, um, the staff, uh, who were briefing me said, just sound it out, <laughs> and you don't want to be the first chair responsible for ASL. <laughs> so we call it CASEL. Uh, we also have new responsibility under recent amendments to the um, Elections Act of Canada for uh, supervising registration of robocallers during federal elections and by-elections. Um, and so um, quite a, a, a range of issues uh, and uh, complicated uh, governance. But as I said, we can only do what statute uh, allows us to do. And, uh, but the Broadcasting Act has a general principle that you cannot broadcast in Canada except under a license or under an exemption order. Uh, by the same token, under the Telecommunications Act, if you're a telecommunications common carrier, you're, you're subject to certain uh, responsibilities of, um, of getting tariffs approved, unless, of course, they've been foreborn from. And on the telecom side, 90% of the revenues of Canadian telcos uh, are deregulated. So what is left is rather a, a narrow area. Um, when I became chair, I certainly changed. I mentioned the regulatory capture issue, and we certainly said what we were going to be about <laughs> was ensuring that Canadians uh, receive a world-class communication system. You, you saw it mentioned as well in our video. And when we talk about Canadians, we talk about Canadians in three ways. I know some people often associate me with a consumer agenda. It's actually a little bit more complex and rich than that. And it's Canadians as uh, citizens, Canadians as creators, and Canadians as consumers, uh, because there are certain issues that I refuse to consider as purely consumer issues. Um, the rights of, uh, uh, of a minor official language uh, communities living in minority situations, that's a quasi-constitutional issue. Rights of accessibility for certain communities, to me, is not a consumer issue, it's a citizenship issue. And so I, I like to think of these three areas of citizen creators and consumers, a bit like an overlapping Venn diagram, sometimes you uh, might be a, a Canadian a French speaker in a minority situation. You obviously want Canadian uh, French language choices. Let's say you're living in Manitoba, a predominantly English province, and you want it at an affordable price. So there's both citizenship issues and consumer issues uh, that overlap in that, uh, in that area. Um, that's not to say that the consumer issues are not major. You mentioned earlier the question of pick and pay. Uh, in Canada, currently, uh, communication costs are the fifth largest uh, household expense, um, and uh, around $280 uh, a month uh, per, uh, on average for a family, the Canadian dollars, so a, a, quin a considerable amount of money. And in certain respects, often outpacing, certainly was on the cable side, outpacing uh, the consumer price index. So it was growing, uh, a large basic uh, package that was uh, growing and growing, and that's one of the reasons why in the Let's Talk TV proceeding, we went down the road of, uh, of, of changing how uh, television services were offered to Canadians. Um, what we do generally is, is very varied. Uh, licensing, obviously new uh, uh, providers, that's mostly on the broadcasting side. Uh, we as well have a, um, a law enforcement uh, uh, role, but we really rather promote compliance, so we do a lot of outreach for that. Uh, for instance, with respect to the do not call list, um, the anti-nuisance uh, anti call uh, regime, similar to the uh, that exists here in the United States. Uh, we also uh, get involved in the anti-spam world. We also get involved with uh, ownership transfers. Um, unlike here in the United States, that is entirely our responsibility, although the Competition Bureau can also look at it from uh, concentration of, uh, of an anti-competitive uh, action, but most of it is ours, and uh, we've dealt with some large uh, mergers. Uh, in large part, Canada's had a policy that encourages a great deal of horizontal, vertical, 
and uh, every other kind of uh, uh, concentration or consolidation of ownership. The idea was that um, Canadian companies needed girth and breadth to be able to compete internationally. Um, sometimes I wonder if that was a wise uh, decision uh, because we do not see a lot of Canadian companies actually uh, competing internationally. Uh, they seem to uh, rather uh, stay in their domestic territory where there's a great deal of protection. Um, on the telecom side, we also involve ourselves in improving tariffs to the extent that they have not been foreborne. Uh, um, an area, and we, as I mentioned earlier, we've foreborn a lot. We also try to encourage uh, competition uh, because uh, uh, regulation is a, a, a poor uh, substitute for a properly working uh, marketplace. We are very open to the Canadian public. Uh, we have nearly 16,000 uh, contacts of, uh, per year of, of any sort. Remember, we're only a tenth of your size. Uh, every year uh, from Canadians asking us various questions, uh, complaints about what they've heard on television or heard on radio, uh, complaints about the quality of their service and, and, and so forth, or just providing information. So we have a, a lot of outreach on that side. And we also develop policies, and by here I, uh, policies I mean contrary to the broad policy statements that are found in the Broadcasting Act and Telecommunications Act, which go on for several paragraphs, but basically are equivalent to the public interest tests that we find in the US uh, legislation. Um, we adopt second level policies uh, and the Supreme Court of Canada has given us the, the uh, permission to do that. They're non-binding, it's just the commission speaking out loud. In fact, it would be a jurisdictional error on our part to apply those policies uh, uh, as if they were regulation. But we, we like to think out loud so people know and expect and it creates a business climate that um, that says to somebody if they're coming in to, for instance, uh, get an approval, um, that generally this is what we would be looking for or not if you came for an approval. So that, that's, that we do a lot of policy statements, uh, small p policy. Uh, our structure, uh, like the FCC, I'm both uh, chair and CEO, so uh, all the staff, all the uh, back office, the enabler functions, I am IT, HR of the 450 or so staff, uh, they all report to, to, uh, to me. Uh, it's a model uh, that the Australians have adopted, the FCC, as I mentioned, and it provides uh, a great deal of, um, of responsibility on the chairman uh, because not only do you uh, head the College of Commissioners, and there could be 13 at any given time, uh, up to 13, right now we're seven, um, the um, you also have the responsibility of the other part of my day, which is running the organization. Um, we have regional offices in Vancouver, Calgary, uh, Winnipeg, Regina, Toronto, Montreal, and Dartmouth, uh, just across uh, the way from uh, Halifax. Um, the lead staff person uh, is Danielle May Cucinato. She's the Secretary General, and she's actually responsible for all the processes, she and her staff, from of receiving applications or considering tariff notices or so forth, all the way to decision making. But in terms of policy responsibility, there are policy centers from each of them, including a new position I created when I became chair in 2012 of a chief consumer officer that has the specific task of actually looking at all the applications and, and applying a, um, uh, a lens um, that is uh, consumer focused. It's not the only uh, aspect, it's one of many, but it's something that needed a little bit more um, attention. Uh, unlike the FCC, commissioners at the CRTC have no staff. They don't operate as independent offices. We are a collective group of decision makers, uh, and we come to the table together to make decisions. A uh, single commissioner has, there's one minor exception, uh, but generally does not have any authority on their own. They always have to act with a other commissioners or a group of commissioners. Uh, I, as uh, chair, however, I have the power to appoint panels uh, to consider matters. So if there's a competitive uh, application for radio uh, frequencies, uh, say in Quebec City, uh, I might appoint a panel of three commissioners to go and hear that matter and make decisions. Um, and um, again, unlike the FCC, which has, I understand, a minister of law judges that hear matters, CRTC commissioners actually hear evidence directly. Uh, to, uh, to make decisions. Um, commissioners have 
as I said, regional out right now we have seven. We have most of them are regional commissioners, uh, except the two uh, vice chairs. Uh, historically, one called broadcasting, one uh, uh, called telecom. The statute doesn't provide that. In fact, one could wonder why we still have that dichotomy in a converged world. But uh, there is uh, those uh, those two aspects of uh, the responsibility. Our uh, reporting to the public, our, the way we frame our three-year plan, everything we do is under three pillars, we, uh, which we redefined in 2012 when I started, uh, under the create, connect, and protect. Uh, create is uh, to ensure that there's a wealth of diverse uh, content available to Canadians uh, uh, to enlighten, entertain, and inform them. And this can be both Canadian, Maine, and foreign. We're a very open uh, marketplace uh, where foreign content uh, a lot of it being American, obviously, uh, is uh, welcome and appreciated. Uh, the Connect Pillar deals with making sure that we have high quality, affordable uh, connectivity. So this obviously includes telecommunications activities, but includes as well cable, satellite, IPTV, uh, and internet activities. And the Protect Pillar deals with matters of uh, 911, um, uh, emergency alerts, uh, loudness of ads on TV, uh, protecting children from uh, certain offensive content, uh, all the way to spam and uh, um, do not call. We try to be forward-looking in what we do, uh, and what we're trying to ensure is that there's a, a strong Canadian presence, uh, Canadian-made presence uh, in, in, in the space, so that Canadians have, among all the other choices, some Canadian choices, and we try as well to ensure on the competitive side that they have choices and innovation uh, of service providers. Um, I think one interesting uh, aspect, and, and I think probably the hallmark of the CRTC, is consultations are us. Uh, we, um, to render about 450 or so decisions per year, uh, run about 12 oral public hearings a year that last sometimes two or three days, all the way to three weeks, uh, depending on the subject matter. But we are actually sitting as commissioners uh, and hearing evidence, not sworn, as I mentioned, but people come in, whether it's an individual Canadian who decides to have their say, or organized groups come to our proceeding. Most of our decisions, the other decisions, are based on a, on a paper record, so we hear, in a, in a sense, the evidence on, on paper. But uh, the most important files uh, tend to have an oral component to them. Um, and we also have less formal outreach uh, uh, in the form of uh, uh, using our convening power to bring people to, to round table type discussions to discuss issues, for instance, of uh, official language uh, or accessibility issues and where we try to bring people to collaboratively uh, come to solutions. Uh, our tools uh, to get Canadian involvement have certainly been diverse and, I, and I, I think we are seen in the Canadian government as a center of expertise for how to consult. Uh, how to, uh, and unfortunately, once you're seen as an innovator in the space, what you did uh, two years ago doesn't seem that new anymore because everybody has uh, taken, uh, taken it up. Uh, but we use digital advertising, we use Facebook, Twitter, we use, even used Vine uh, videos before they, they died. Um, we, um, our most recent was in the context of the broadband proceeding and using Reddit. Uh, oh no, so it was not in broadband, it was on the uh, differential pricing proceeding. And we saw that there were discussion tr threads about zero-based rating and uh, said, well, maybe there's an opportunity to reach out to a community that doesn't normally uh, participate in our proceedings. So uh, we announced that we would be doing a, a Reddit uh, consultation. Uh, oddly enough, the Reddit community then had a discussion about the fact we were having the use of Reddit and setting, you know, disciplining each other about how we, they had to be pretty polite and nice and uh, so that the commission would do it again. Uh, and then they participated in the proceeding and we took the record of that discussion and put it on the public record. So um, because we are evidence-based and, a, and a, uh, uh, we do public interest uh, decision-making based on, a, on, on the factual records we gather in paper and at the oral proceeding. I, mean, I talked earlier about the fact that we 
are seeking the public interest, and it's defined in our statute. And I often use the image of our hearing starting off as a darkened stage, and everybody shows up at the hearing with uh, a beam of light, whether it's a, a large, organized, well-funded beam of light or individual coming with a, a smaller beam. And in the end, hopefully, at the end of the process, uh, with all the contribution, we will have discovered together what the public interest is. So it's very important for the Commission to get the public to be, participate in our proceeding. Um, and we've done it with some success using new platforms, whether it's Twitter or Reddit or uh, our website or online discussions. We even used a choice book because we realized in one case uh, when we were reviewing the TV policy that everybody was saying, well, it was a me conversation. This is what I want. And people weren't thinking about what their neighbor or the person down the street might want. For instance, you might want to have children's programming in a broadcasting system, even though you don't have children, because it's good for the society. So we used this choice book, which forced people to have a conversation, a we conversation, as, as opposed to merely a me conversation. And that was successful. Our proceedings are both English and French. We have interpretation going on all the time. Uh, all our official documents are in both official languages of Canada, English and French. And on occasion, depending on the issues, we also use uh, American Sign Language or Le Langage des Signes du Québec which uh, makes for quite an interesting hearing when things are double translated as we go through uh, the proceeding. Uh, but a very open and accessible forum, uh, and probably one of the most accessible forums uh, in the federal, uh, federal system. Um, the type of issues we're dealing with these days are obviously telecommunication, making sure we have sustainable competition. Uh, we do not get involved on the telecom side that much, if at all, on the retail side. There's one small exception where we actually re re regulate retail internet services in the north, uh, in the territory. Uh, but for the most part, our action are on the wholesale side. By way of example, we have uh, mandated access to fiber facilities so that competitors can use the fiber being laid by others at a rate that has, will be set by the commission. Uh, we, have also, um, we also regulate the wholesale access rates for wireless uh, carriers so that competitors can access uh, the um, uh, infrastructure of the three large incumbent companies in Canada that together and operating together control about 90% of the internet, uh, the uh, wireless space in Canada. On the television side, uh, just like here, uh, I suspect, although on average Canadians listen to about 27 hours of television per week, uh, the fact is that people under 35 aren't, so you can imagine that the older demographics are watching a great deal and people are moving to an on-demand, and so the Let's Talk TV proceeding was very much about redefining that that shift away um, from traditional schedule programming to on-demand programming uh, where schedules didn't matter and in fact you would be listening to what might be seen as traditional television in a very untraditional way, in an on-demand way, which means that some of the tools we've used by the, in the past, like quotas, which were very successful at a certain time, don't work going forward to ensure Canadian choices are there. Therefore, we're moving towards other means of promoting rather than protecting uh, Canadian content. We hosted a discoverability summit to look at ways through algorithms and other man man means of, 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 uh, uh, of Canadian content makers to be able to have Canadians and others around the world, because we're also thinking that we have to work internationally, discover Canadian content. On the digital side, since the 1990s, the Commission although the definition of broadcasting is quite large under the Broadcasting Act, we have uh, decided not to require licensing of broadcasts. Uh, technically, Netflix activities would, in Canada, be a, um, uh, a broadcasting activity that would require license, uh, which would be difficult to obtain because the government has told us that uh, broadcasters in Canada have to be Canadian-owned and controlled. Uh, but since the 90s, the Commission has found that it need not regulate in that space by requiring licensing. And so we did regulate by exempting them from uh, holding a license. Um, so I always make sure that people realize that we do regulate, but we regulate by exemption and not requiring them to hold uh, that. But the fact that we can exempt 
undertakings uh, that are streaming services in Canada um, clearly points out the fact we believe we have jurisdiction over those undertakings, even though their servers may be found elsewhere uh, because the activity is occurring in part in our jurisdiction. On the uh, linguistic duality side, that's a very important in Canada, so we work on that uh, to make sure that Canadians of both official language group uh, uh, see themselves and hear themselves and can create in their language, but as well uh, um, acknowledging uh, that Canada is a modern immigration-based uh, society, also ensuring that we reflect the diversity, both employment-wise and uh, and through its programming of the ethnocultural diversity of Canada, not to uh, exclude, of course, uh, Indigenous Canadians, uh, who are also important in terms of ensuring that they by their ownership or their presence in the Canadian broadcasting system, uh, find a place and a voice. Um, some differences with the United States, I think uh, I mentioned a few uh, in terms of our, of our activities, is that almost exclusively federal jurisdiction, very little state, well, your state or municipal government involvement, um, very large horizontal, uh, vertically and uh, diagonally integrated companies, um, which brings its own uh, own challenges, and of course, uh, much more act, uh, presence in specialty networks and satellite radio, unlike um, here. Um, wanting to put Canadians at the center, so the second part will illustrate how we did put Canadians at the center uh, through our basic uh, telecom services review, uh, which we called in part, let's talk broadband. Um, the question we're asking is what telecommunication services Canadians require to fully participate in the digital economy? And we were asking that question in a very wide sense. Um, our proceeding based on a lot of the expertise we've had in other proceedings trying to get Canadians involved, managed to get, in one way or another, over 50,000 Canadians uh, participating in our proceeding directly. Uh, that took the form of 25,000 individual Canadians actually sending us submissions. We also had over 800 formal uh, submissions from businesses, municipal groups, chambers of commerce, uh, consumer groups. We did a public opinion survey, which was rolled into the public record uh, that reached about 30,000 Canadians. And we did 30, uh, three weeks of uh, public hearing uh, in which we heard evidence from 80 interveners. It was um, probably one of the most comprehensive reviews that the Commission's done in recent times. Over a year and a half, it started in April 2015 and the decision came out in December uh, just before Christmas. Multi-stage and we really saw it as a national conversation as to what ought to be the future of um, basic telecommunications, how it should be defined, and what the future of broadband would be. Um, and we were primarily targeting uh, Canadians in uh, unserved or underserved areas. Uh, can imagine a ter the three uh, northern territories of Canada have a geography uh, larger than Eastern and Western Europe combined, but a population of 135,000 people. Um, but even just a few miles outside of Ottawa, the nation's capital, you have people that don't have access to broadband. So there's a very big digital divide in terms of, of, of that. So that was one of our big issues. And, and yet, we knew that it had become uh, an essential uh, means by which you get e-health, e-learning, e-government. Uh, I myself, when I was at the Treasury Board uh, Secretariat as an Assistant uh, Secretary, uh, the government, to save money, was moving away from uh, offices and, and, and any other channels of communication with government to online, yet there are large swaths of Canada that do not have access uh, and an affordable way to that, that, that content. So these are the sorts of issues we, we were dealing with going into that. And we got Canadians involved, the 50,000 uh, of them through uh, social media, online forums, uh, actually focus groups, various news releases, and uh, very much wanting to have a broad conversation about the future of uh, content, uh, of basic telecommunications in the future in Canada. Um, in telecom, I think it would be fair to say that in the past we've mostly focused on voice uh, as to what ought to be um, basic. Um, service, but now uh, we, we 
shifted our thinking considerably and consider voice to be an application like any other. And what is essential to have is uh, the broadband uh, connectivity, which opens the doors to all the other applications of any form or sort. So now in Canada, since December, broadband internet access is now considered a basic telecommunication service. Of course, the press life to say, oh, Canada, it's now a human right. Well, we don't have the jurisdiction to make declarations about what's a human right or not. Our act defines, you know, you can define what is a basic telecommunication service, and that's what we did in, the, in our proceeding. Uh, we created new uh, universal service objectives, and we created a fund. And I'll unpack those one after the next. Um, so in terms of broadband, uh, we said it was uh, essential. It was... Uh, um, important to Canada's future economic development, uh, its global competitiveness. Uh, it's also important for social development, access to various services, and as well as uh, a place for democratic discourse. As more and more Canadians, particularly younger ones, are uh, leaving behind radio and television and printed newspapers, we now see that the conversation about society, about what's happening um, in your own backyard or around the world is occurring in this space. So it's very important from a democratic uh, uh, perspective. It's also the place where we're finding innovation uh, and underpins the vibrant creative and interactive and uh, creativity that we're seeing there. So even though it was a proceeding dealing with telecom, it was essentially also considering where Canadians, the creators, would be able to make their space of creativity and share that content with their neighbors and the world. Uh, and you'll see that with our target to us, upload speeds uh, were uh, very important from that perspective. And it's important to connect Canadians. Vast distance, second largest landmass in the world. And although many of us live within 100 kilometers of the United States, it's still you know six, uh, six and a half time zones. Uh, that you have to, uh, to connect uh, as well. And it empowers uh, for the quality of life in various forms, but I needn't uh, need to convince you in people in this room. Um, the decision also in the second pillar decided that um, all Canadians in urban areas, which was largely occurring uh, through market forces, but also in rural and remote areas, would have access to voice services, which was the old uh, uh, objective, but also access to broadband internet access, uh, both fixed and mobile. Uh, so the outcome would be that telcos continue to invest. Obviously, we don't we don't want that to be slowed down. Government had to continue to support. There were government programs, and I'll, I'll speak a little bit more of that in a second, um, to finance the ro robust, scalable um, infrastructure that's capable of delivering this high quality service. And as well, we wanted to enhance social and economic development. The targets we chose, um, uh, the previous increased by uh, tenfold before it was five and one. We decided to move to 50 up, uh, 50 down and 10 down. No, it's the other way around. The arrows are wrong, aren't they? on the screen. So it's a download 50 and a upload of 10. Uh, we already believe we're at 82% of that. Uh, and uh, we, uh, with the third element I'll talk in a moment, uh, are, uh, are aiming to get 90% of Canadians uh, at that level by 2021. It's the law of the highest, the last few Kilometers are the hardest and most expensive to connect, and hopefully 100% by 2031. Um, we also uh, provided that there be access to the latest mobile wireless, not only in homes, but along Canada's major roads. Um, and you see that the slide compares uh, the new standard adopted in early 2015 in the U.S., um, which is uh, obviously... The Canadian standard is a very ambitious objective, but a critical one for all the reasons I pointed out earlier, particularly in rural and uh, uh, non-urban settings. Um, and this is this will be the major challenge, um, and we're trying to dis to continue. So the 18% gap between the current 82% and 100% is mostly found, as you can see from this slide in the uh, rural and, and remote areas of Canada. And um, that's why we created a new funding mechanism. 
that builds on the funding mechanisms available by other levels of government. Uh, it will be, and it's for the first five years, up to $750 million, these are Canadian dollars, um, to help promote uh, the uh, build out of, 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 the, um, of the network to ensure that the, those that are unconnected are properly connected. Um, it will focus on ensuring that the funding mechanism will be object based on objective criteria, uh, would be transparent, uh, would be fairly uh, administered, uh, efficiently administered as well. Uh, uh, there are various programs in, in the government uh, of Canada and uh, we always are concerned about the delivery costs of those uh, programs. Uh, and, uh, and also, we were very concerned about uh, that there would be no political interference in those decisions. Uh, being remote uh, areas, there's also a risk that if politics get involved, it is the place where there are fewer votes. But yet, everybody's a Canadian and entitled to uh, the basic services. So managing of the program at an arm's length uh, was a, a clear decision point for the Commission. Um, the program will be designed to ensure access to and transport infrastructure for fixed and mobile. We're trying to be um, neutral in terms of technology. Uh, we clearly stated it would continue to be a shared uh, responsibility of industry, governments of all level, and the regulator. And uh, it will be a competitive uh, bidding process for the best application uh, to get access to that money. Um, in the decision, we also made other statements that I think are not so much about the build-out, but are important in terms of uh, consumer empowerment and accessibility. Um, we will now require that wireless service providers offer and publicize mobile service packages that meet the needs of uh, the disability community, whether they uh, have a disability of, of, of speaking or hearing or other types of disabilities that require uh, uh, adaptability, adapt, uh, adapt as you. Okay, I'm not finding the English word, but uh, adapted to their needs. Um, the synapses sometimes don't, don't trigger off like they normally should. And, um, and as well, we've included uh, some obligations to give better information to consumers more generally. I'll give you the example, my father, Okay, I got my mother on a streaming services, so there was more demand on the network. But month after month, my father was realizing he was getting overage charges uh, for his fixed uh, broadband. And I saw, and he finally asked me uh, about it, which is odd because you think your father would, who figures, you know, his son works at the CRTC, would, would see that there might be a useful resource there. But anyways, I saw that. And the overages was because he had a bad package. And so uh, we phoned the, the service providers in a non-competitive area. But just by asking, I ended up getting for him, without even negotiating, more capacity, higher speeds for less money. So you said to yourself, why are they not actually proactively offering their customers this and and it would seem that shareholders are more important than subscribers um, and and uh, you know there's often discussion about disloyal customers I think there's a place for a reflection on disloyal companies as well I'll move on um, so um, there are some of the issues we made a lot of decision in our broadband decision about uh, expectations but we also made some um, what we call preliminary decisions uh, or express preliminary views, which then says that a third party will, will run a process and people can comment on whether that preliminary view, that way we are leaning, is the correct one and they can uh, uh, make comments on that. We've recently launched that, that proceeding. And it really focuses some on the details of the administration, the third party that will be responsible for receiving, for instance, that uh, um, uh, those applications uh, to sh for the share of that 750 million uh, amount of money. Uh, and so that is going on now. Um, there are other, a couple of other issues in the proceeding that, that got a lot of airtime, um, and that was dealing with other uh, gaps in the system, uh, dealing with affordability for low income consumer groups. Um, uh, and they wanted us to uh, find a funding program. Uh, and digital literacy, which 
was not really at the center or the core part of the CRTC's mandate. Um, Concurrently with our proceeding, the Minister of Innovation uh, had launched in 2016 a proceeding to examine um, the future um, uh, of an innovation agenda for Canada and had asked us to submit what we were hearing in the proceeding dealing with things that he might find uh, of use in his proceeding, and so we did. And affordability and digital literacy were two matters that we, we did a report and sent to the Minister. Uh, in budget 2017, the, uh, the Trudeau government um, did make some statements about the future of innovation, connectivity. Uh, interestingly enough, the government committed, and this is the words, committed to working with the CRTC to coordinate broadband targets and establish ways to meet them. Notice that the government's committed to working with the CRTC, not the other way around, which is a rather interesting way of formulating things since um, we're, we're within the larger government. Uh, they did state uh, in that budget speech that uh, it was a shared responsibility for the regulator, obviously, but also for municipal and provincial and territorial governments, First Nation governments, and uh, telecommunication companies would be part of that, uh, the players need to, uh, to do them. They announced a $500 million uh, program. There's sunsets after uh, five years, as I understand it, and it will focus on building the backbone uh, traffic between communities uh, and like ours will be based on a competitive application process which is open till the end of April 2017. Now for the two issues we had made recommendations on affordability and digital literacy, uh, the government made some announcements uh, for some additional funding there as you can see on the screen for 29.5 million for um, digital literacy and 13.2 million uh, beginning in 2017. 18 uh, for affordable access. As a result of that budget, which I think some of the groups that were advocating uh, uh, before us uh, about digital literacy and mostly affordability, um, seeing the budget and I guess being disappointed by it, uh, made an application to us pursuant to Section 62 of the Telecommunication Act, asking us to review and vary our decision uh, and coming back at us. Uh, uh, suggesting that we should uh, intervene uh, more directly and deal with the affordability issue. So that matter is uh, pending before us and therefore I will have no future more comments at this time uh, on that, but uh, that proceeding is underway. Um, sorry, I should have moved that slide, so that's the uh, budget announcement. Um, if you want more, there's obviously our website. Uh, you would probably want, if those are interested in net neutrality issues, want to uh, keep close attention once the market closes at four o'clock on Thursday when we will make our uh, decision public on differential pricing practices uh, and zero rating. Uh, uh, I think it's much anticipated, uh, especially with developments here in the US as to where, where goes net neutrality. Uh, in Canada, uh, we have been involved in this space since 2008, 2009 and uh, we will continue to be concerned about net neutrality going forward because the last thing we want uh, is our telecommunication companies becoming gatekeepers uh, like our cable and um, uh, satellite companies. Uh, it's a space for open discussion, democracy, uh, and any inappropriate, and that's the, the question, when does it become inappropriate, attempt to uh, shape the traffic or to shape what services are available, for instance, at lower or zero rating, uh, would be allowed to, uh, to be distributed um, and to whom uh, raises some uh, rather uh, interesting uh, public policy issues. And you'll know more about that on Thursday at 4 o'clock when we render all that public um, as to the way forward. Anyway, you can also stay connected with various uh, website and uh, social media for us. And uh, there we go. So thank you very much for your attention. Happy to have conversations uh, and question answering for you. Okay, so open it up to questions. I'm gonna ask that you keep your questions to tweet length so and uh, phrase them as questions with a question mark at the end so we can have as many people speak as possible. Yeah, and just please introduce yourself um, very briefly. 
Hi, I'm Ron Newman. Um, from my personal experience, the, the U.S. do not call list simply does not work. There are too many exceptions, and it just doesn't seem to work. Uh, have you gotten? Have you managed to do it better, and how so? Um, no, I don't think we do any better. Um, and it's uh, the do not call mostly list. Uh, we've made exceptions as a result of, of a lot of lobbying uh, for charities, uh, for um, and not us. It's in the in the actual legislation. Exactly, it's the same process. Uh, I would say in Canada, at least we've justified it ostensibly by some uh, constitutional principles of freedom of expression. So uh, we've said if you're trying to sell a subscription to a newspaper, you're exempt, and uh, there are a lot of exemptions. But our big problem right now is not so much that, it's spoofing. Spoofing is actually our biggest problem. And the fact that Canadians still, in large part, think that the anti the do not call list is a bit like a municipal bylaw. You file a complaint and some officer is going to complain that individual phone call you got at 8 o'clock on the 16th of April while you're having dinner. And that's not how we do it. We do it through mega um, data uh, analysis and go after offshore, uh, mostly offshore uh, uh, providers of these unwelcome services. Next question. I, uh, you covered a couple of my questions, but I was wondering, is the CPC an arm of the government, and do you regulate it like any other telecommunications entity? And also, do you do anything with regards to regulation of objectionable content or political speech of any kind on the web or in the internet or anywhere else in the telesphere? Okay. Uh, the CBC in Canada is uh, created and constituted under the Broadcasting Act. It's a crown corporation. Uh, it is funded to the level of about a billion dollars a year by parliamentary appropriations. Uh, so it, it operates as an arm length uh, from the rest of the government, but we do regulate it. it they have a license from us. We hold a proceeding uh, every, f well, it uh, could be seven years, but about every five years to renew their, all their licenses, radio, television, English, and French. Um, and so we look at their plan and so forth. But they are a crown corporation. They, they have a CEO who's appointed by the government. They have a, a board of directors who's also appointed by the government. Uh, but they are accountable to us as broadcasters. Yeah, we regulate them um, from that. A variation of what occurs in Australia with their public broadcaster and uh, in the UK as well. Uh, sectional content on the radio and television traditional space, we have co-regulation or self-regulation, uh, but on the internet side, uh, because we've largely uh, exempted it from holding a license, that area is not subject to direct CRTC involvement. Um, there are, of course, laws of general application that continue to be uh, applicable there, um, but not uh, CRTC involved. Well. The Broadcasting Act actually says the commission shall exempt if we find that licensing those activities do not contribute to the, the um, objectives of the Broadcasting Act. And now on two, if not three occasions, the commission has come to the conclusion that that space is not contributing uh, one way or the other to the, the uh, uh, Broadcasting Act objective, so we have not uh, filled that space. That's not to say that the others have not. The Human Rights Commission uh, and 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 when it's or even the Criminal Code has gotten involved in, in certain respects. Hi, I'm Saul Tannenbaum. Um, I have a question of call it national linguistic nuance. Um, in one of your slides, you. You said all Canadians in urban areas as well as rural and remote areas have access to voice and broadband internet services. Here in America, access is often a key, you know, a key word used by conservatives to mean something other than actually having access to a service that you have something that you can theoretically get, um, but not really. Um, what does it actually mean in your context, um, what what barriers are you actually seeking to overcome, and does it act? You know, does it mean um, actual service or some promise of service? Uh, actual service. 
uh, realizing that it needs to be built over time. There are some uh, very remote parts of the country that you know it'll take time to build and, and build out to, but it's actual service. Um, access to a library is not the sort of access we're, we're thinking about. It's actually residential and along the major roads that, uh, as I mentioned, on the cell side. Hi, uh, my name is Filippo. I am a second year here uh, from Sudbury, Ontario. Um, in the last budget, I, I've seen this floating around the internet that the federal government's currently looking at reevaluating um, many aspects of the innovation agenda, which, or of, of telecommunication regulations, which may, may include net neutrality. Um, I was just wondering how that review may be distinct from what the CRTC has done and how we as interested people can get involved. Well, I, I saw that. I mean, we're not involved in, in budget making, but there was, uh, because we're independent, I saw the, the comment about net neutrality. I, the Commission has already set out the policies on net neutrality um, back in 2009 about traffic shaping, and I th we've made another decision that got support in the Federal Court of Appeal, uh, the mobile uh, TV proceeding, uh, where the court gave us reason when a cell provider um, uh, making arrangements to provide television services in a, what we thought was undue and unfairly um, uh, inappropriate. Uh, so we've we've dealt with uh, with that, and I dare say that by four o'clock on Thursday, we may have a complete code of net neutrality in Canada because we'll have pronounced on what the policy ought to be for your uh, rating. Uh, I'm not sure what's left, frankly, on net neutrality, other than a, the government has also said that they want to review the uh, Broadcasting and Telecom Act uh, at some point. So that's very unclear to me right now what that means or, or, or why. My experience has been that the both acts work quite well because they have that very open textured uh, drafting style that allows you to uh, navigate ambiguities and changes of technology. But it's up to them to make uh, those parliamentary decisions. But it, it's a, that's a three or four year process. I'm going to use my prerogative to ask a question, which is that your definition of, of uh, basic service is both fixed and wireless to the home everywhere, which seems extraordinarily ambitious in a country as big as Canada and sparsely populated. So it's really a, a mandate of last kilometer access you know, everywhere. Um, why? I mean, why not just allow wireless to do it instead of saying, well, you know, especially at your definition of 50 up and uh, 50 down, 10 up, uh, you would think that by 2021 we might have wireless that would do it. So why the fix? Um, you're probably reading the decision differently than I am. Um, certainly, mobile along roads, for sure, as a public safety issue. Uh, but we were neutral as to the technology that could be used to provide broadband access. So it's more of an or than an and uh, between fixed and, and mobile. Um, the reality is that in some places, mobile may be the only way to do it because of islands or whatever. Uh, but uh, definitely an or there. But it was the outcome that's important. My apologies for misreading. Um, th this sort of clues into a, a debate that's happening here in the United States about whether mobile access is, is well, good enough. Well, it, it, it's, it's an interesting distinction because oftentimes people talk about mobile. The reality is a mobile network requires as much uh, line-side connectivity. You need the backhaul, you need the trunk lines, you need everything. It's only the last little bit that's uh, um, uh, wireless. Um, but in some places, actually quite effective uh, to serve a remote northern uh, village. We've, we've certainly done fixed wireless uh, um, quite effectively. Um, thank you for that clarification, Pat, Pat McCormick, because I'd misread it too. One of the reasons uh, mobile versus fixed can be an issue, certainly here and in Australia, is whether net neutrality, as much as those principles enforced, are enforced on both mobile and fixed. I know you're waiting on the decision Thursday, but are you looking at uh, it being comprehensive and coverage across those different technologies? Um, look, um, what's important is connectivity, and you don't want to trip over which technology is 
it's a it's actually really effective and our hearing on differential pricing certainly pointed out and that's why unlimited packages are so uh, available for wireline uh, broadband and less so on wireless well that's a question of time uh, some interveners in that proceeding however pointed out that well if wireless connectivity is such a limited bandwidth that that you can have more traffic shaping or more control why then are companies offering zero rating or differential pricing in that space uh, and we're saying well therefore you commission uh, to encourage more unlimited services in the wireless space should not be allowing uh, uh, differential pricing in the wireless space. So, but you'll have to see what happens. Thank you. My name is Caroline Chiro and I'm um, at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. I wanted to ask you about data. And uh, I realize it might be a little bit outside of the CRT uh, CRTC's purview, but given the given that you're you're seeking to help perpetuate the digital innovation economy, that a lot of Canadians use American services and a lot of Canadians' data is stored in the United States, would you prefer that not to be the case, or do you pursue a specific relationship with American regulators or American companies to manage that? Um, we've had people approach us. Uh, because they have been concerned that our connectivity passes through the U.S., uh, Patriot Act concerns and, and, and others. Uh, we have not gotten involved in that space, we the CRTC. Uh, interestingly though, when the Government of Canada got involved in some of the data and connectivity issues and its own email systems as an enterprise, um, we invoked the national security uh, exemption and uh, required uh, our networks to be entirely Canadian based. So the government is, of Canada at least is hinting in a direction that, of concern with respect to where data is. But of course the U.S. is, you know, a, a strong and, and uh, close ally of Canada, so uh, it's, uh, it's not an issue that has come uh, forward to us. A any other questions? Uh, I, I realize that we're a bit past the top of the hour and people have other commitments, but well, if not, then it only remains me to uh, thank Chairman Blair for his uh, incredible presentation of the CRTC and of the de uh, decision and correcting my misapprehension about uh, what it is, but nevertheless, I think an incredibly ambitious uh, policy and one that would serve well as a model for lots of other countries in this space. So thank you very much. Thank you.